Right, good afternoon everyone, and apologies for any continuity issues. <clears throat> this is a re-recorded introduction. It's the first ever retrospective introduction because we had so many problems with recording this first time round. But that's not a problem for me. Um, I'm always very happy to have a second opportunity to thank Creative Scotland and Education Scotland for the funding which they provide for these creative conversations. And it's rarely been better spent than the way we're spending it today. We have two absolute educational legends, Tim Brighouse and Mick Waters, here to talk to us about their book, about our schools improving in previous best. They are genuinely amongst the kindest, most supportive, most generous, and that's almost a repetition of my previous statement, of people that I know. But they are also towering intellects with an absolute wealth of experience. And they've encapsulated that better in this book than in any other book that either of the two of them have been associated with. The advantage of this retrospective introduction is that I've now read a great deal more of the book, as well as having spoken to both Tim and Mick on at least three occasions about it. I am absolutely loving reading the book. It's, it's humane, it's balanced. At times, I think they bend over backwards to recognize the quality of the contributions that have been made by various secretaries of state. But nonetheless, they have captured a huge range of witnesses. And while they all talk about education in England with occasional references to Scotland, this is a book that's absolutely relevant to anyone with an interest in education. It's a history, it's a series of anecdotes, and it's a set of recommendations. And I just want to start the conversation off by welcoming both Tim and Mick and asking you, either of you, both of you, whatever, um, to say to people, what, what is the book about? What, what are the main purposes of it? OK, well, picking up from that, David, uh, I'll kick off and say uh, what I think it was about. Uh, we, we, we start with the premise that it's the teacher that makes the most difference. All the research suggests that teacher impact on on outcomes is far in excess of the school as a whole so in the school variation between teachers and if you were in any doubt um, you, look, uh, you know no sorry tim i think you were mid-flow and i think david's got a bit of delay so why don't you carry on and if david yeah. comes okay. back we can deal with right. it okay Let, thank you deal with that. um David is a delight to work with, and uh, I feel for him with his Wi-Fi connection. Um, we've written this book. It's mainly about England. But please don't switch off all our colleagues in Scotland because we think there are messages here for Scottish teachers and schools particularly. Uh, we start with the premise that the teacher makes the most difference, um, and... We believe like Gino, you remember that lovely quote, I've come to the frightening conclusion that it's what I do every day in the classroom that makes the difference. I set the climate, I create the weather. And so we start with that and we say, well, what's happened to the English schooling system, particularly since a very important date for England was 1976, because Jim Callaghan, then our prime minister, uh, gave a speech at Ruskin College in Oxford and um, speculated about why the schooling system wasn't doing what everybody wanted it to do. Now, this was approximately 30 years after the war, and we'd had a period during that period of optimism and trust. Schools got on with things, local authorities built schools, created outdoor pursuit centers, adult education, etc., etc., all sorts of support services. And then after Callaghan created a doubt uh, and disillusion. About 10 years later, we had Kenneth Baker, who produced a great education reform act. And I think he produced a second age, which is one of markets, uh, centralization and managerialism. And what we look at in our book is, well, what's the impact of that? What's worked well? We, we 
genuinely believe that some things have worked quite well. What hasn't worked well? There are quite a few of those. And how can we do better for the future? How can we launch a new age of hope, ambition and collaborative partnerships? So that's what we did. And we thought the way of going about this, Mick and myself, we decided, well, we'll interview all the secretaries of state there have been since Baker. And we more or less did that. We interviewed 14 secretaries of state uh, and nobody refused us. We just couldn't get hold of a couple and one had died, etc. And we talked to ministers. We talked to HMCIs, which is much the same as you've got there. It'd be Graham Donaldson's whoever he has succeeded him, that, that those people. And we talk to what we're now emerging in England as multi-academy trust leaders and one or two major charities such as Bernardo's. And we said, what ought our schooling system to be like? How ought we to change it? Now, unless you think, oh my God, not more change. What we think is that it's the influences outside the school that are that get in the way of schools themselves wanting to unlock the talent of all the young people within their schools that get in the way. So basically that's what we wanted. And Mick will outline to you now what issues we looked at and some of the recommendations we made for the future. Over to Mick. Well, good evening, everybody. It's lovely to be with you. Yes, I'm, I'm Mick. I'm the... Uh co-author of this book and as Tim said we we set about interviewing all these people we interviewed over 100 just to sort of get their view on where we were and we do think we're on this sort of step of a of a new age in England which is all about hope ambition and collaborative partnerships now in Scotland you've been collaborating over the last few years a, a lot lot better than uh, we seem to manage in England because we we have such competition running in the way we we work but as Tim said Teachers and school leaders, head teachers, typically want the best, don't they, for every child? And they they typically want to make make it possible for children to take that step from from home and family life into the big wide world to sort of find the way in the world, be able to manage themselves, be able to sort of organise their own lives and have an influence, and in a sense change the world. But we found that a lot of sort of circumstances beyond the school make makes some of those things inhibited. And, and the things we looked at were um, structural things like governance and finance, uh, things like the way uh, arrangements for children with special needs is organised. We looked at the way uh, schools uh, are governed overall. We looked at the way in which um, the curriculum, teaching and leadership are provided for so that we we enable teachers rather than constrain them. We looked at the exam system in a big way and, and we kept picking along at the different sort of strands of it till we came to some recommendations as, Sim, as Tim alluded to. We, we came up with six uh, really key starting points, what we call foundation stones, things called schools. And we think schools in Scotland could actually pick up and, and use. Uh, and, and the system could pick up and use. And then we came up with 39 steps, which are things that would take a lot longer, but structurally could be put in place in England to make things happen. And you might be thinking, well, that's England. We think many of the things that we propose in our six foundation stones and 39 steps are transferable, but maybe need to be interpreted different in the Scottish system where we think you're a, a little bit in advance of where we are in England. Um, Tim, do you want to carry on from there? Yeah, I'd just say this about, um, about where you are in comparison to us. Uh, you've always been, if you look back historically, you've always been a bit reluctant to do what the English are deciding to do, and we don't blame you for that um, at all. In fact, we think that's probably the right course of action. You've had a wary out eye out for unintended consequences. So, for instance, you haven't got academies and multi-academy trusts. Uh, you didn't go for grant-maintained schools when they were around. Uh, you, you have caught some of the competitive um, kind of habits, such as publishing uh, outcomes and uh, uh, inspections of schools have become tougher. And what we think 
is that you've got an example south of the border which has gone far too far and therefore we're trying to change all that we we also think that what we've witnessed in this period uh, that we've lived through over the last 40 odd five years or so uh, is more and more centralization more and more power in the hands of the secretary of state now Mick and I have just read a book we both read it twice and we're going to read it again because it's so bloody difficult to understand uh, which is which is called hatred of democracy I do recommend it to you it's only 100 pages but don't be fooled I've got to say it's the most difficult 100 pages I've ever read um and by the way nowhere near as readable as our wonderful book of 600 which is like which is like picking up a comic. It's so easy to, to absorb. Anyway, this book by this French philosopher kind of points out uncomfortably, because we've been arguing for greater democratic control and participation. He argues that, well, we don't really live in a democracy at all. We live in an oligarchy. I mean, it may be different sorts of oligarchy. It may not be any longer the, the, the landed gentry who are controlling us. Um, it may be an elected oligarchy, but it is an oligarchy. It's a few people who are deciding on our behalf to do everything. Then, of course, when you look at something like Brexit, Mick and I would say, <laughs> well, I'm not sure we want everybody um, involved because they might come to decisions which we, we wouldn't totally approve of. And I've got to say that this book makes you jolt a little bit about how far do you want participation? Now, that always makes me think, well, you know, history is a race between, as H.G. Wells said, between education and catastrophe. And all this audience are in the business of educating people. And what we have, what we have decided in what we've done in the book is to say, look, south of the border, we do very well by it used to be about 10 or 20 percent of the population i think it's now probably near 40 50 60 percent of the population through our schooling system but we have what we call the forgotten third and we think that with the changes coming in our society whether it's through automation robotics nanotechnology artificial intelligence all the dangers around social media or uh, and the prospect of climate change are our schools and is our curriculum geared for their future needs or which we believe south of the border but you've got a much better curriculum uh, is it is it backward looking and prepare people youngsters for a world that no longer exists i mean for instance when I started out, there were millions and millions of unskilled, semi-skilled jobs. Now that's dropped to a few hundred thousand and it's dropping all the time and it will drop further. Um, personal care, interpersonal skills is far more important than it was. So we're arguing, come on, there's a doubt and disillusion about where we are in the schooling system. And I think there is in Scotland as well, despite your having some advantage on us, what ought we to do to usher in an age which will be characterised, as we both said quickly, of hope, ambition and collaborative partnerships? By collaborative partnerships, we mean schools really working together to share good intentions. And on the six foundation stones, I'm going to quickly name one and Mick will then come in and name another, both of which we think are strongly relevant to Scotland. The one I'll start with is creating an open school. Uh, now, south of the border, we've got something called the Oak Academy, which has been created during the pandemic uh, and provides its groups of schools that have got to, what, a group of schools that have got together, funded by the DFE, and any school can plug in and get repeat lessons are and it's mainly secondary um which which uh, would substitute for a school's best efforts <coughs> we're not talking about that we're talking much more about something like the open university now the open university was cre 
created, opposed by all existing universities. But what the Open University has done is to transform the curriculum and methods of almost all the universities, at least south of the border. And I think it's had an influence north of the border as well, which, which, is, which is that I noticed when I spent some time at Keele University in the late 80s, early 90s, that loads of the academic staff were summer tutors in the Open University. And the outcome of that was that they brought the best materials, the best methods, back into the university and created the best possible uh, experience for the kids, for the young people, the older people who attended that particular university. In my case, as I said, it was Keele. We think there is a case for curating the best materials and experiences in an independently funded open school and that every school would access it, both the pupils and the teachers, so that the, the very best opportunities are within the reach of pupils and teachers, irrespective of the school they're in. So in a sense, the youngster belongs to their own school and they also belong to the open school, which is trying to make the very best of the changes in technology and digital opportunities. Now, some schools are doing this, they're doing it with um, expensive and sometimes not very good privately created opportunities. And I know that through GLOW, you've experimented very early in Scotland. And I don't know where you are on the open school, but I bet you we meet a brick wall on that south of the border. I don't think ministers will respond to it. We, we're we looking for ministers to drop a huge sum of money to create such a school so that it lives off the interest of an endowment which would be provided by uh, the uh, by the DfE on a one-off basis, but it would be run by we think ideally located with the open university and i know you've got a, a a gtc you could have a gtc and you could have a similar arrangement in scotland so the very best of what was on offer would be available to teachers and pupils mick i know wants to that's one of our foundation stones the six areas mick will talk about the expert consultant teacher yeah, yeah, just before you mention that, Mick, if I may, um, there's something really powerful, Tim, not only about the whole idea of the open school, but when you bring that back into the context of COVID, effectively individual schools and individual teachers are being asked to generate that kind of online content for individual classes. We have created a massive workload for teachers and schools which often has distracted them from their key purpose because we haven't had that resource that was there, ready and accessible. And the idea of redirection to something like the open school rather than that constant creation of online content from, from schools themselves strikes me as being a real breakthrough in terms of people's thinking. Oh, I think that too. I think it's the most important of our recommendations. I've started, um, why on earth don't you do it north of the border? I mean, you, you could create it. I think it would require, because our systems are different, it would require an open school in, uh, uh, but they could liaise with each other. They could be cross-border uh, uh, liaison and learning from each other. But you could do something in Scotland in that respect. And, and my, my plea to you is mount a campaign. I'll come back, David, later on after Mick's talk. But I think there are loads of messages for Scotland in our book. But but Mick, come on, on the expert consultant. Yeah, and, and I think I think this has certainly taken us into one, Mick. Um, you've been invited to talk about this this expert teacher, if you like, the expert consultant teacher, um, and that will certainly have resonance here because we've had a real journey in Scotland around the charter teacher post and so on. So delighted to hear what you've got to say. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. I mean, what we're talking about in our foundation stones is is reinvesting in professionalism, really. One of the 
upshots of the uh, high stakes accountability that we've had in England over the last few years with uh, sort of quite fierce inspection built on the back of data coming out of exam and test results is that teachers uh, have, have had their professionalism affected. Head teachers are often seen in England as managing directors of the school carrying out government uh, instructions and teachers therefore become the operative. They do what they're asked to do and they turn in the, uh, the required effort. And what that leads to is business-like teachers who are very, very committed and very, very uh, uh, so, sort of hard working, efficient people, but actually start to become very compliant and very passive in outlook. And our, our concept of the expert consultant teacher is that we reinvest in professionalism to enable teachers everywhere to work with people who are fascinated by and deeply engaged with uh, pedagogy, assessment, aspects of learning, which might be to do with special education needs or children from disadvantage that really enable us to get deeply into consideration and practice that makes a difference. And this is a bit like the chartered teacher scheme. And in England, we had the advanced skills teacher scheme for some years. But the problem always was that the sort of gate was too wide open and too many people became those categories. And at the same time, in England, the schools sort of took the opportunity to sell out their expertise rather than to invest more fully in it and build expertise. And our notion is a bit like hospital trusts have consultant medics or consultant surgeons. We want schools to have consultant teachers for various things, consultants for pedagogy, consultants for assessment, who become the sorts of teachers that other teachers want to gravitate towards and they want to be in their team. And their team doesn't necessarily have to be in their school because we're talking about collaboration. It could be in a team that extends over a bigger area or a bigger region and so on, especially using virtual means. So what we're talking about is teachers who help other teachers to grow and teachers who develop their own skills, their own capacity, their own concepts, so that they become experts, expert consultant teachers uh, that move the profession along without waiting for government or other central agencies to drive the agenda for them. It's about putting the agenda back in into the hands of teachers. And that, in a sense, goes alongside the open school proposal because you would have the consultants really enabling the open school to work really effectively. Uh, I'll perhaps stop there, David, and you can sort of come back on us and talk about it. And maybe in a bit we can talk about uh, some of the proposals we've got for children and young people in terms of how they learn, because I think they'll be really applicable, not just to Scotland, but to individual schools, because they could take it on for themselves. Do you want to come back on what we've been talking yeah, about? I do. I do, because one of the things that you're very consistent about is your starting point around yes. teacher professionalism. And Tim started off with the Gino quote about the teacher and the impact that the teacher has. And I absolutely agree with that. Um, one of our problems in Scotland is every time we have a difficulty, we, we have a, a systemic solution for it. So we have a new curriculum, we have curricular change, change we have new benchmarks, we have whatever. And whenever we meet these changes, everyone in the system has to change regardless of how effectively they were performing before. Um, so that idea of teacher professionalism seems to me to be absolutely critical because I, I, you know, I share your view that the key to improvement is to make sure that we enable those who are already working well to continue to work well and where possible work better. Those who are working less well to improve, to be influenced by the quality that's there in the system. But how do we get the, the political stability, if you like? How do we get the politicians away from this idea of the big solution and the big change and get the stability that allows the kind of development that you're talking about in terms of that expert consultant teacher? I, I, think, I think one of the issues is that I don't, I, in England, for the teaching profession has become very passive. I know in Scotland it's, it's more dynamic than it is in our country, but, but what you need is a teaching profession that's always coming up with 
new suggestions, new solutions, new ways forward, as opposed to waiting until the next solution is foisted upon them. And you'll only get that if you get a cohort of people who are really qualified in the sense of being able to talk uh, uh, talk in a way which is persuasive about where the system needs to go next and to keep bringing forward ideas for the future to the agenda. If, if you simply wait until the politicians suggest the next change of direction, the, where the points are going to send us next, then we're always chasing the, chasing the argument. I think we have to get in front of it and be developing it, always be promoting research, always be promoting uh, practice in classrooms and spreading that practice, taking that to politicians and showing them rather than being on the sort of waiting for the tennis serve and knocking it back over the net. So it's about getting on the front foot. Tim, do you want to? Well, I, I, I want to slightly argue with you about that, Mick. Yeah, and, go on. And, and with Dave. So I do agree in matters ped pedagogical curriculum assessment, what you're saying is right. But there are other issues uh, which I don't think the profession can define for itself. I mean, for instance, we're arguing that how on earth can you hold schools and teachers accountable unless you've set out what the purposes of schooling it are? Uh, and we haven't south of the border. I mean, uh, all, all we've got is Michael Gove's few, uh, fewer than 40 words, uh, which, uh, which are about teaching, uh, enabling youngsters to learn the best of whatever is there. No talk about youngsters thinking for themselves and acting for others. None of those things. And we've set out in our, our book um, some possible about a dozen purposes. And where I, I, I think Mick's right in what he said in, the, in that territory, but I think there needs, and we've set it out in the book, that there needs to be a kind of 10 year plan between parliaments that, that, that Everybody with a vested interest in the schooling system. So people from higher education, employers, from faith groups, from unions, from every every walk of life that is interested in how citizens behave should come together in a standing schooling commission, a framework commission, and would set that framework. This is one of our foundations. So it's terribly important south of the border because the ministers the secretaries of state have taken more and more and more powers to themselves you may not know it but they used to have just three uh, in england get rid of how you got rid of air raid shelters the securing a sufficient supply of suitably qualified teachers and rationing the amount for buildings and capital program and approving the open, opening and closing of schools that was their three now they've got over two thousand and we think that leads to the kind of managerial outlook and only valuing what you can measure, not what you can assess. All that is something we need to reverse. So we are very much in favour of a standing, a sort of framework commission for schooling that would set a plan for 10 years, cross party, involving everybody, and then the Secretary of State, if they wanted to do anything, would always have to refer to how it was within that plan that had been created by that body. And the body itself would comment from time to time on where things were going. We think that's the only way you can avoid, back to that book I said was really, really difficult to read, authoritarianism within within uh, apparently a representative democracy. And we really do desperately need that. Now you may say Scotland, 5 million population, everybody knows everybody. We can get, uh, we, we can get our, our pennies worth on, on into the ear of ministers. I'm sure that's right, but I have noticed in Scotland that there's the same tendency to centralise, centralise and centralise. And I think you could profitably repeat the exercise that we've done, do it in Scotland, but in particular, try to create a 10 year plan that gets renewed 
irrespective of the party in power. Because I've noticed again that the SNP, having been in power for some time, and I'm not entering into your politics, how would I dare? I do dare south of the border and I get into lots of trouble for it, but I wouldn't dare north of the border. But I would say that it, there is a great danger that you're going to go the way we've gone with all the dangers that we've had and some sort of framework commission is what you need in Scotland as well as here. I mean, coming back on that, Tim, the, the, the Scottish curriculum does have some really good aims at, at the beginning of it. Uh, but the politicians, uh, a few, a couple of years ago, when they, they got worried about results, suddenly started defining a different set of purposes. And so we have the same political problem that we got in, in England, that we lurch in, in various directions, depending on what people, politicians see as the pressure. And one of the problems is that they've forgotten they established purposes in the curriculum a few years ago, because we've gone past that now, and now we're dealing with something else. And one of the values of a standing commission is that it keeps referring back to what's already been agreed and where we're trying to get to. Uh, what we found in our book is how little uh, little, fu little future politicians see. They're so busy thinking about the next election or the next sort of political upheaval, and they are part of a, a big uh, revolving agenda beyond school. Uh, but I, I do think that the Scottish system does have some aims that are more clear yeah. than our, more clear than ours are. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think what, one of the things that's really interesting in Scotland is that the whole uh, development around curriculum for excellence was rooted in a national debate, which was so good we had it once. Um, well, that's right. You need the debate continuing. Not, not. Oh, we've done that now. Now let's get on with redefining the agenda in the way we want it. <laughs> and that's, exa that's exactly what's happened here. That we had that great national debate. Out of that, we got the broad picture, the broad principles, if you like, of curriculum for excellence. And we've never gone back and done it again. And it's become a political hostage. Um, and I, and one of the things that's worth saying, I think is that education has become much, much more of a political football in Scotland in the last few years than, than it ever was previously. There was a lot of consensus initially around Curriculum for Excellence because it had the blessing of that national debate, if you like. Now, because education has been the key priority for the First Minister, it's become open season on it and we've lost that stability. And again, I think, <clears throat> if I may, it's just really interesting to look at what's coming in in the chat. Uh, Ruth Mackay coming in, a bit of support from other people about the whole idea of agency for head teachers and consultation with communities. And we, we, I think we're arguing for that, but I think what you're arguing for as well is some clear frameworks within which that will operate. So we need these purposes, we need that clarity, that needs to be there at national level. And I think that blend between agency and consistency, between change and continuity, I think you're looking for something really important and vital there. What, what other strategies, if you like, are, are you suggesting that would help take us forward? Well, I think, I think you might be interested in two programmes that we suggest which are intended to capture the interest and build on the talent of all pupils in the system. We In England, we have a, a good proportion of pupils who turn away from the system quite early. They they realise there's not much in it for them. They, they, they've they twigged that our exams are norm referenced a long while before a lot of the grown-ups do. They know that their chances of doing well are not good and they lose interest. And some children who are going to do well in exams also learn interest because they're not that relevant. So we propose two programmes that people might be interested in. We, we say that they should be doing it right across England, but you could do this in a school. And if I were now back in a school, I would be thinking about trying to do it. The first is a universal provision for children from year six to year nine. Uh, and the second would be offered to pupils, uh, to a different 20 percent of pupils in every secondary school annually with all pupils included every five years. So every year in the secondary school, you choose 20% of the children who haven't done this yet. So by the end, they, they've hit this programme at its 
it's the right time for their maturity. The first there is uh, Seeking Talent and Extending Participation Scheme, which stands for STEPS. And we propose that each pupil should be able to demonstrate their learning through participation in this Seeking Talent Extending Participation Scheme at two points in their career. The first would be that point which is year six into year seven. We call that first steps. And the second would be in year nine, which we call next steps. You could have another, I suppose, later on. Uh, each child, each pupil would, with support and design, manage an, ex uh, an individual extended project, taking a day a week for at least 20 weeks. And the outcome would be a presentation by that pupil of what they've learned, including multimedia approaches, uh, being presented to an assessor, we put assessor in single inverted commas, uh, and the project would be expected to focus upon the real world, the world of work, the function of democracy or the structure of communities or the natural world or health. It would seek to identify their talent wherever it lay, identify their interest and build on it. And the audiences for the presentation would, would need to be authentic and would rely on local businesses and employers, councillors, public sector agencies, all providing something that enables that contribution to be really positive. And each per, per, uh, pupil will be supported in devising and arranging their own programme and we, we'd make sure safety checks were in place, but it'd be authentic and real world experience and each pupil would get some money. So there's some money to fund your project and make it work. We, we propose modest amounts for year six and year nine to do that. And the other program which we propose is called Extraordinary Learners with Exceptional Creative Talent. And if you spell out the acronym, it's ELECT, your elective, as opposed to SELECT, which is what we, we, we think is <laughs> maybe not helping. We believe that schools should be very Calvinistic, mate. Very Calvinistic <laughs> in the school. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we believe that schools should try try to provide pupils with rich experience across a really wide range of activity and, and they should consider the widest experience that pupils get as really important. But the central agenda in England, and I suspect in Scotland as well, is dominated by exams and tests and so on. So we think that we're trying to develop exceptional talents. Now, you know, we need to look for the likes of, and we know the few and far between, but the 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 Shakespeare's, the Beethoven's, the, the Berners Lees, the Mandela's, the Barbara Hepworth's, the Jane Austen's, the Fitzgerald's, the Helen Sharman, the, the Sarah Gilbert's, the, these people who make a difference to society, these geniuses really. And all these people have tried to make the world better. And, and what we're saying is that they're also people who, who sort of grab the agenda for themselves. They're what Tim Moore's calls auto dictats, they, 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 didacts. They, they put, not dictats, didacts. They, they push their own learning. They're single minded people so that they get forward. So we want them to, we want our children to, to build on that notion, extend their own talent and really push it forward for themselves so that they, they take forward an elective. Some people might remember programmes like Gifted and Talented or Able Children programmes. We're not talking about that. We're talking about electing at the right moment in the child's maturity to take part in something which they really hope, which they really enjoy and will sustain their, their learning, sustain their development, push themselves forward by personalising it. And we give 20% of the children whether they're SEND or whether they're really talented already, an opportunity every year, depending on when they're ready for it, when they come forward for the operation. So that by the end of those years, all five year group, all, all, all children in, in those five years have had, a, had an elective. And we think that that sort of programme could be picked up by a school individually rather than by the by the nation and really push forward and as i said if i were if i were still ahead i would be doing those sorts of things so that you don't put learning uh, limits on the learning of children that you don't sort of stunt the horizons you open horizons up and ignite their passions going forward but so they're, they're just sort of a couple of examples tim what do you want to come back on that no, well, I, I mean the last one david is entirely to do with the belief that every child can walk a step or two of the way with genius, genius, and and we think they can, 
Uh, and and you know, if you have, I know you've read Bounds by Matthew Side. I, I guess some of the audience have as well. Which which it, it, he he was. Uh, well, I won't go into it because I guess the audience know it. But if they haven't read Bounds by Matthew Side, it would be worth re reading. It's the notion that every youngster, if you can find what they really burn about, give them good coaching. They do a lot of it. They grow in confidence. They know they're getting better at it. They're keen on it. And it spills over into their capacity to handle uh, setbacks in other bits of learning that they don't naturally relate to. We, we think that the ELECT programme will help that. And all of that, we think, will powerfully affect and help mental health. One of the things that, that you talked about, Mick, um, that was reported back to me, I didn't actually hear you say it, but you had this wonderful comment that you made about what we do with children is we, we assess them. And then on the basis of the assessment, the performance, we make a decision about ability. And on the basis of the decision we make about ability, we decide on potential. And so we lock children into that triangle of performance, assessment, ability, potential. And what we never do, or my translation of it is, what we never do is we never give children the opportunity to surprise us. That we put them onto tram lines, if you like, because we're pushing them through the curriculum and we never reevaluate the potential. And it strikes me that that's one of the main things that prevents us raising attainment, that we, we lock children in. As long as they achieve the predicted expectation, we can tick the box of accountability and move on. And what you seem to have built into these programmes is exactly that opportunity for all children to surprise us. And I love the fact that this is not about rewarding talent, which is what the Gifted and Talented program was. Um, it's about identifying, revealing and recognising. And that seems to me to be a much more progressive and constructive way of looking at how we engage with children. I think that's right, David. In our book, we talk a lot about assessment and the way it works and how hard it is to find your way through what's really a complex world. But the, one of the points we stress is that most powerful assessment is ipsative assessment, where it comes, you know, ipsos, the Greek word, you know, ipsos mori and all that, thinking about ourselves and understanding where we stand and seeing it from our point of view. And that notion that however much uh, we are told we are good or not good at things, it's what we think in our mind that makes us successful or not. And one of the problems with assessment that's done in a lot of schools through testing that then tells children what their potential might be and gives them a flight path in <laughs> if you're not careful is that you affect that if ipsative assessment you know if you're if if you're a sportsman and somebody tells you you're very good in your heart you know that you're as good as so and so else but you're not quite as good enough yet so you know where you need to go if somebody tells you you're awful you say <laughs> OK, I, I accept that because that's what the ipsative assessment or you say, well, I'll prove you wrong then. What we're trying to do in these two programmes is to suggest that children can grab the agenda and push their own potential, push their own talent and seek out people who can make a difference. Seek out people that have got that sort of experience, knowledge, understanding that they require. And we think I think that's a really important facet of all people's learning, not uh, children especially. Yeah. There's a real head of steam building up in the chat um, around teachers feeling that they don't have the opportunity to either advance their career within teaching, that they need to go into management. Um, the idea that people exhibit good practice and then it's not adequately recognised by the system. And, and an awful lot of support, I think, coming through for the two programmes for the idea of the expert teacher and for the idea of agency. So maybe it's a good time now to move on and see what other areas are there that you've identified as, as sources of hope and progress. Well, I'm going to absolutely down you on hope and progress and, and just simply say, I want to raise a real problem because 
because it affects Scotland. Uh, and and in our in our system, we we are preoccupied with assertive discipline and zero tolerance, and it's come in over the last ten years. And um, so the, the it isn't merely that kids do their work and and uh, and they get marked in a in a kind of norm reference way. Is it's that for instance we came across teachers who said I'm not looking forward to going in next week because I haven't. I haven't given my correct number of detentions, which the head teacher of the school wants us to give, um, which surprised us. But then we met our behaviours are, and um, we're not so surprised. Uh, we've reached the point in England where there's about 47 million in England, the population, and in 2018, 7,853 children were permanently excluded by individual schools in England. In Scotland, which is about 4.7 million, you can see why I've used 47 million and 4.7, because you are about a tenth the size. So if we were 7,800 odd, you ought to have been 780 permanently excluded, but you weren't 780 permanently excluded. You weren't even 78 permanently excluded. You weren't seven excluded. There were only five children in Scotland permanently excluded. Now, we think that the reason for that is a huge credit to you. You have a better curriculum. You aren't so preoccupied with... Um, zero tolerance and giving the right number of detentions in the way I described or isolation rooms or whatever. You don't even use the same language. You, 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 you aren't so um, punitive as we are. And of course, as Mick was pointing out when I was with him in another of these earlier today, you know, the correlation between kids being permanently excluded and and subsequent difficulty including prison sentences is it's a cor it's a correlation it's not a causation but it's 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 mighty interesting that there is a relationship between the two so we think that when we put that to our uh, secretaries of state a they were surprised b they'd not been to scotland and c the comment of us was well you know what the scottish system like it's nowhere near as good as ours. And we were we were stunned by this reaction because we said, look, are, are you saying that it's a good thing that we've excluded all these children and that they're on their way to jail? Oh, no, no, no. So Michael Gove said, no, we, we recognise this is a necessary evil. Uh, and we said, well, in Scotland, it doesn't seem to be anywhere near as necessary as... <laughs> It seems to be in England. Now, I wanted to raise that because we genuinely would be interested in what you've done to reduce that awful happening, happening to the extent uh, that it happens in England, which, by the way, you do better than Wales and you do better than Northern Ireland, but both of them do better than England. And I really do think that there is a huge worry about that number of children being excluded. But more particularly, have you got problems in your behavior? Are you gonna say, oh, well, we should have excluded more children? What will you say? Well, I think the, the situation's interesting. Um, Gillian has well, made the point in the chat that the statistics may not reveal the whole situation in Scotland accurately. And, and I think there's some evidence for that. Um, I have a, a currently we've we've got a lodger here who's in her first year of teaching in a really difficult school and she's had a terrible, terrible time, which she's gradually beginning to get on top of, you know, talented, bright young woman, and she is making a difference. But some of the things which really help here is that as a director of education, these children are my responsibility. If I was still a director, they would be my responsibility. I would have to find a place for them. 
Whereas in England, because the system's fragmented, once they're out of the school, there's a huge risk that they're out of the system. Um, you know, I, I would have had the resource as a director to find a place for that child in another school, in another provision or whatever. And But I think because it's been made a priority in Scotland to reduce exclusion and get better outcomes in that regard, people have simply worked harder at it. Whereas the necessary evil has become, in a sense, the inevitable evil in England. And people are actually encouraged towards exclusion rather than away from it. Yeah, I'll just say that um, one of the upshots of writing this book has been that a lot of people have read it and they, a lot of head teachers have found that little section about exclusions and they're getting in touch with me now saying, is there anybody in Scotland we can get in touch with? So if there's anybody here watching this who would like some contacts with people in Scotland so that we can have a collaborative partnership around how we address pupil behaviour and encourage the best behaviour in children, uh, we, we, I'd be lo I'd be really delighted to know that because I can put people in touch and build up a little community of interest. Um, so that that's just a by the way thing. Uh, but, but there's a hugely important thing, Mick, uh, if, and uh, apologies for cutting across. No, no. Uh, but I think one of the things that Tim and I have been obsessed with for a long time is this idea that we're on this small island or set of islands with four different education systems and, and absolutely no real openness or willingness to learning from each other. So one of the frightening things, apart from your exclusion statistics, is the fact that none of the secretaries of state visited or engaged with Scotland. Um, and I said, they, they, they go to Singapore or wh wherever or, or America. They don't yeah. bother to learn from you or vice versa. Yeah, I mean, one of my mantras a while back was confiscate their passports. Um, you know, that, that classic idea of they're doing really well in Uzbekistan. It sent their, their PISA stats through the roof. Let's do what they do, because we're just like Uzbekistan, you know, that, that kind of culture. Whereas here we are in a, a tiny geographical area failing consistently to learn from each other. And I think the more cross-border practice we can have around that, the better. I think one of the things that you've said, Tim, before is that England is very good at getting movement, not always in the right direction. Um, Scotland at least recognises the right direction, but has more challenges in terms of movement. So, you know, I think, I think there's some interesting thoughts there as well. One of, one of the people we interviewed was Andreas Slicer, who is the uh, director of the OECD uh, education branch and who organises the PISA tests. And I think even he was realising that using raw data from tests and promoting uh, different nations or jurisdictions as being more effective or less effective is having a, a, a less than valuable effect on systems across the globe as each tries to sort of outdo the next and rush to the Pacific Ring or run over to Scandinavia or Uzbekistan and copy there. And and what he was recommending and or proposing was that they need to, to change the emphasis in their uh, in the way they give, gather evidence about school systems. So they stop this uh, this lurching around really <laughs> that politicians do. I, I was telling in the book the story of um, I travelled out to New Zealand in 2013, I think it was, to work with um, the education people over there. And as I left England, I left uh, Heathrow, it was the day the PISA results were produced. And it, it said in the newspapers, UK results, terrible. And it gave examples of where England had done badly in the test, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, because you can always find something where we've done least, less well or where we've gone down from last time in positional ranking because there's always new countries coming into these tests. So I got on the aeroplane and landed in Kuala Lumpur and I had two hours to wait there while they put petrol in it. And I walked through the airport and there was a newspaper saying uh, nations in this Southeast, area, Southeast Asia fail in the, in the PISA test. So it was Malaysia, 
it was Thailand, it was Vietnam. We've all gone down. What are we going to do about it? I got back on the plane and landed in Sydney to change planes again. And it said Australia bombs in the tests. We've got an education in crisis. And as I landed in New Zealand, New Zealand apparently had plummeted in the tests and New Zealand education was in crisis. And one of the effects of the OECD PISA tests is it gives every politician some some uh, arms, really, you know, to some some ammunition to have a go at their system because everybody somewhere will do less well. And that's a bit like we keep talking to children about their potential based on their test scores. It isn't appropriate to do it, but we we've got to get a professional voice that's much stronger to yeah. keep keep the agenda. <laughs> How long is it going to take you, Mick, to work out that wherever you are, the education system's in crisis? You know, clearly, every time you arrive in a country, it's PISA test bottom down. But, but I think one of the really key points for me about that is that there are schools in England, you know, I, I know this from the evidence, there are schools in England which outperform Singapore in terms of the PISA tests. But the average, that's not what the average says. And what we do is we respond to the average and fail to recognise the excellence. And it'll be exactly the same in Scotland, that there will be schools which perform at a level which would earn them a top place in the PISA league tables, but not enough schools are hitting that. And instead of raising the general level in the way that you've suggested in the book, um, by focus on professionalism, teacher agency, and so on and so forth, we look for a systemic solution to what we perceive as a national problem. We look at whole system change in order to address what, what's being presented as whole system issue, but it isn't really a whole system issue in the first place. Tim, you've got a book out. What are you going to well, write? I've got a book out, and it's, <laughs> it, it's um, one here, which is um, a book by Nancy Cartwright and others, and it's about uh, children's safety and and the reason i put it up to show is, is is the discussion we're just having nancy cartwright who's a philosopher she's written that with uh, an economist and she did an earlier book called um evidence-based policy making a practical guide and what she said was and it is worth thinking about that there are two axes to consider when you're considering change that you've learned about from other places, including we're beloved of randomized control tests, but she says you don't want to be misled by them. And that there are vertical things you need to do. You need to get the right people in the right place in the right way. So something that works in one place won't work in another place because the vertical bit isn't done right. Or the context in terms of horizontal is terribly important. And actually that's true for every school that they need to learn the differences before they follow somebody else's uh, ideas um, in order to implement change and improvement. It isn't that you shouldn't learn from other places, you should, but you should realize that it is judgment and experience that is gonna make the difference and that's why we think that you, there's no substitute for what Mick was talking about in terms of expert consultant teachers and a pedagogy that is really steeped in skill in various pedagogical areas. Um, and that person should be a key person in terms of change that's brought about in any school. Mick's gone to get another book, I could tell. Uh, well, I, since we're waving books, I don't know whether you've seen this one, which is... Uh, the political political management, the dance of government and politics. It's written by an Australian researcher, Jennifer Lees Marshman. We we quote it in our book, and she says that politicians over the last twenty years uh, have had to change the way they behave, but they they've failed to realise that they can't just keep imposing new new you know new requirements on people. What they've got to do is learn to dance better, as though the people that they're trying to develop, make make more effective, are partners in a dance. And in, in our country, when we talk to our politicians, we, we didn't think they were very good at dancing with the teaching profession. So 
we, we haven't got any, you know, they can do all the Paso Dobles, they can do the tangos, they can do the rumbas, and most of them are doing the okie-cokie and throwing things in and throwing things out, but they're not actually making progress. But there is another side, I think, to this, which is that the teaching profession could be an active partner in the dance. And too often, I think it wants to be the cloak in the Paso Doble rather than get up and drive the agenda. So it sort of fixes on the back of what Tim was saying about Nancy's book, that it, it is about our agenda coming forward and, and really moving it forward. There's a good book that if you get a chance to pick it up. I'm, I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna try and just pick up on a couple of things, if, if I may. There's a real groundswell coming up in the chat um, about teacher time. You know, there, there's a real belief amongst people attending the conversation and the whole idea of head teacher agency, teacher agency, the ability to move forward, but a real sense of people being under tremendous pressure, both in terms of time and effort. Have you got anything to say in the book about that whole idea of teacher time? It's been a big issue in terms of discussions in Scotland recently. Well, I would immediately say that it's not surprising because we've been through the most appalling period, haven't we, with the pandemic and the expectations on teachers south of the border and north of the border by the rest of society has been considerable and largely unappreciated um, and, and certainly them inventing their own online answers doesn't help their time so I'll be back to the open school as a valuable resource which will save enormous amounts of time if it's done really well um, uh, so I do think that. I think that poor management in schools also contributes to people uh, to um, staff feeling under the cosh, uh, and and therefore the more we can help people uh, live in an environment in which they're appreciated. Uh, I, I mean, above all, every teacher and every member of staff in a school wants respect. They want responsibility. They love to lead on things. They love new experiences. Uh, and and they want that. And, and they want recognition. And, and if you can have a, a school environment where that's happened, it energizes people. Uh, unfortunately, if you're done to and you're always dancing to somebody else's tune, as Mick says, you know, not having the ability to really be part of the of the dance, uh, then it, it seems to me that you're going to be exhausted. And, and too often teachers are exhausted. Uh, the three words that Tim used about our system at the minute, centralisation, marketization, and managerialism. We, we talk in the book a lot about the fact that managerialism takes over if you're not careful. So filling in the forms, the, the, the head of the school filling in forms for somebody else, the teachers filling in forms to keep the head happy so they've got something. So this feed in the machine mentality grows. But I think Tim, you know, Tim touches the, the right nerve when you talk about people want to feel valued, they want to feel respected, recognised, they want to feel they're making a contribution. That's the same for children in the class, by the way. That if you if you feel you're making a contribution, you you're generous with yourself. You feel you belong. And my experience of working in schools over, over many years is people work incredibly hard and want to work harder when they feel respected and valued and recognised. Uh, tiredness is a, a genuine thing. The system itself is not very forward looking, is it? We all get tired at the same point because the term ends with everybody shattered until we sort of start really thinking about schools for the future and working them in a different way. We're probably always going to feel that, but there's a difference between fatigue and being fed up. And people can be tired and exhilarated, or they can be tired and flat. And you get you get exhilaration from doing something worthwhile. A really interesting point that's been made here about time and energy. You know, I think, I think where we have the energy we feel we have all the time in the world, um, but it's the interaction between the two, isn't it? That we, yeah. we get that energy. And, and one of my big arguments that I've been banging on about a lot recently is that, you know, don't complain to me about overwork. I've given you a wellbeing seminar. Um, yeah, yeah that's right. You're overworked, try Pilates. That whole culture that we've got, whereas the real 
energy comes from job satisfaction. Yeah. And what your book is fundamentally about is how do we get the system out of the road so that teachers, head teachers, nursery nurses, colleagues working in schools can actually do what they are good at and be supported to improve within that. And I think you've, you've set out a whole set of means of doing that. I'm starting to pull things to a close because I'm having a look at the numbers. Um, and before we go, I want to give Linda the chance to come in and tell us who's likely to be taking away a free book today. Um, could I also say to people that it would be well worthwhile checking out at Teacher Hug Radio we did an interview in Teacher Hug Radio, which is run by Paul Dix with Tim and Mick, and it's now available in a box set as part of the Ideas Hour series. If people want more uh, of this conversation, they can get more of it through that link onto Teacher Hug Radio. There's some great stuff on there as well, celebrating teachers. It's a good site um, to pay attention to. But before we finally draw to a close, Linda, do we have winners for our books? We do, but, and there is a but, we haven't quite worked out exactly who they are. I left a little cryptic um, hint in the chat, which I'm assuming that everybody was chatting because we were actually just so naturally engaged with the conversation, which I believe to be the truth. However, we will count up and those of you who have contributed most in the chat will be getting an email and a free book will be winging your way. But for the rest of you, um, Thanks so much for all your contributions and don't forget you can get a discount on the books as well. So we have got three winners or we will have very soon. Thanks. Okay, Linda. back to you, David. And can I just give a massive thanks to, to Tim and Mike? Um, we've had several conversations about this book um, and every time we return to them, I'm encouraged. And I started off making the comment that, you know, you're, you're both extremely experienced, you've been around for a long time, but the level of optimism that you're still capable of displaying strikes me as something that we really need to support and encourage. Um, because if we don't believe we can make this change, the alternative to hope is despair. And despair simply offers a hostage to those yeah. who are in the system. And David, can I thank everybody as well and merely say this as a, 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 we're gaining nothing. It's cost us money uh, and time. We've loved doing it. Uh, but any royalties are going to two charities, Bernardo's and the Compassionate Education, which speaks for itself, what uh, foundation. And um, we therefore hope people will enjoy it. And actually, I have been astonished. I thought it was crap, this book. And and then uh, uh, Mick kept cheering me up and saying, don't be so flat, so energy consuming, you silly old. And he, I won't, he doesn't swear, unlike me. So um, I, 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 I think I was wrong because the, re, the, the reaction has been quite different from many people, parents, grandparents, uh, even my wife read part of it the other day <laughs> and said to me in a surprise voice you know that's quite good some of that book um so it's readable uh even though it's bloody long um uh, but don't read it at one go uh, but i do promise you it's quite a good read with some interesting anecdotes in the middle of it as well so we think it appeals to a wide audience and the whole proceeds are going to charity the Bernardo's guy, Javed Khan, gave us a chilling uh, comment, uh, David, which echoes just what you, you have talked about. He said, the thing that worries me at the moment is that among our young people, there is a poverty of hope. They can deal with poverty, but if there's a poverty of hope, we're in real trouble. And I think you've got fewer children and young people north of the border in a poverty of hope than we have. And we've got a lot to learn from you. Thank you. I'm grateful I'll, for I'll, that. I'll just say, it, it is. I think it is a good read, but read it because it, I don't think there'll be a film. Just you know, <laughs> get, get, get the book read. <laughs>
<laughs> well, there may not be a film, but I'm fairly confident there will be a Netflix series. Um, I mean, I think, again, just to re-emphasise for people, this is a book which contains so many voices. Um, it's got the voices of so many people who are or have been influential in the, in the system. And I think it presents that really broad spectrum of views. And it's an inclusive book, uh, regardless of which party the politicians represented. They've had that opportunity to have a hearing, to say their piece in it. And I think it gives a really useful picture, which we would do well to look at and learn from in Scotland. Because as you say, there are elements that we need to think about. Um, do the same, terms, David. You could write the book in Scotland. Do the same. Excellent. I shall try and find a suitable collaborator who will cheer me up in my dark hours. Thank you so much to everyone who's been part of the conversation today. Thanks so much to both of you and look forward to the next time we sit down and discuss this book. Thank you very much and good night to everyone.